Yeah. All right, how's it going today? Good, you got your... Yeah. Thursday. It's almost Friday though. Yeah. <coughs> So questions on PA5 or anything else? No, I think we're done with ODPs. So will we have a, uh, like a day to like, kind of like what you did before with the midterm, like reviewing the five asking questions? Well, yeah, so next week I'm planning on um, PA5 presentation starting Monday. And depending on how long that takes, I'm guessing that might take two days at the most for this section. Um, and then after that, we can talk about the final, we can do review, you can always ask questions. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely go through that next week. <coughs> I haven't made the final yet, so I don't know what's gonna be on there, but I'll figure it out before next week. So we were dropping eggs yesterday. And do you remember the algorithm we were talking about? So we were trying to figure out the minimum number of experiments that we can guarantee to find the critical floor in a building with F floors and E eggs. And the idea was go through each possible floor and imagine we drop an egg from that floor and if the egg breaks then we have F minus one floors to consider and we have E minus one eggs with which to run some experiments to try to find the critical floor there. And if we add one to that, that's the number of experiments that we'll have to do to find the critical floor, assuming that when we drop it from floor I, the egg breaks. If the egg doesn't break, we had that experiment, plus we have, I keep doing this, that's I minus one, we have F minus I floors, and we still have E eggs. And then we want the largest <coughs> of these, because whichever one gives us the most experiments, that's the one that we have to assume we might need to run if we start from floor I. And then we want to find the smallest of each of those largest. And that's what we return for the value of our egg function, except for the edge cases. We have one egg, where you have one or fewer floors. <coughs> so this is not too hard to code. It's, it's really the mechanics of, of dealing with this stuff in the dynamic save array and the input and output that takes most of the space. The whole thing's 53 lines. Um, including my one comment. Um, but this is the main program. It'll basically ask how many floors, how many eggs you have, and then it will call the egg function with that many floors and eggs and tell you the fewest number of experiments that you need um, to answer the question. So the egg function is pretty straightforward. So base case is one egg, zero or fewer floors, one floor. So three base cases. This checks our dynamic programming array to see if we've already calculated 
the function for this number of floors and eggs, and if we have, it just returns it from memory. Otherwise, we're doing a running minimum. Okay, we're trying to find the smallest number of experiments that we need. So we initialize um, our best answer to the number of floors because we know we can do it with that many experiments. Start from the first floor and work your way up. So here we go through each possible floor. And if the egg breaks, then we're going to have <coughs> somewhere between floor one and floor F minus one. And we have eggs minus one eggs to answer our question. And we add one to that, sorry? Because we're doing an experiment here. So what we're doing is we're saying, let's drop one egg from floor F. Okay, so that counts as one trial. And this tells me how many trials we need to answer the question after that one experiment. So this is the total number of experiments. And then if it doesn't break, the answer lies somewhere in the floors above F, and we still have this many eggs. So we take the worst case of those, because that's all we can guarantee. And if that's better than the best solution we've gotten so far, we save our best solution. And when we come out of the loop, that's our best answer. And we save that in our dynamic array and return it. So let me curtail this print, because that's a debug. So if you have 10 floors and one egg, it takes you 10 drops. If you have 10 floors and two eggs, it only takes you four tries. And if you have 10 floors and three eggs, it still takes you four. And if you have 10 floors and 10 eggs, it still takes you four. So 10 floors, the best you can do is, is four. 100 floors. One egg is 100, two eggs is 14, three eggs is 9, four eggs is 8, and I think 7 is the best we're going to do. So there's, there's a log n <coughs> bound on how good we can do, which is if we have an infinite number of eggs, you can play high-low. You can drop from the middle and then either go halfway above or halfway below and do your standard binary search, assuming you have at least log n eggs. And then any additional eggs don't really help you because um, you can't do better than, than log n. Um, and because of the nature of eggs and the fact that if it breaks from this floor, it'll break from a higher floor, and if it survives, it'll survive from a lower floor, they're essentially sorted, right? You're searching for the critical impact, right, and the impacts are lower, higher, maximum at the top, and you're looking for some critical level, and it's a binary search. But the, the more interesting aspect is when you, when you don't have log n eggs, when you have, say, two eggs, right, we come down from 100 trials to only 14, and that's pretty cool. And I'm pretty sure Wikipedia would have formulas for what these numbers turn out to be. But, um, but I don't know what those are. And we can quickly blow up. Well, I only put 500 in my dynamic array. So 500 floors, two eggs gets us down to 32. Three eggs gets us down to 15. So it's pretty dramatic. And let's just look at the recursion. Let's just print out what we're calling this thing, number of eggs, number of floors, each time that we go into our function. Go with five eggs. And that's a fair amount of recursive calls. I thought it would look cool without a new line, but we can't count. So 
500 floors, five eggs. Nine hundred ninety-six thousand recursive calls. Uh, so we're really, really searching a huge space here, right? And if you think about it, you got five eggs, you got five hundred floors. There's a lot of different experiments you can run, and based on the outcome of that, you have a whole bunch of other experiments you can run. And some of those may be reasonable, some of them may be ridiculous but the total space is you know, a million possible experiments. Without that dynamic programming, this is not going to be very successful. So if we just don't save our result, uh, this could go on forever. Yeah, it's gonna be a million lines of output. All right, so that's, that's egg dropping, and, and it's the same process as how we deal with, with rod cutting or knapsack, right? We take our problem, we turn it into sub-problems. Didn't you enter a 505 in there? Thank you. All right, now we'll let it run. Um, so it's, it's this... Um, two properties, right? One is the fact that we can take the solution of this problem and express it in terms of solution of other versions of the problem, right? Presumably smaller versions of the problem. Um, but also there's this overlapping substructure. There's a fact that any particular call to here will probably be made multiple times. And that's the part that we take advantage of by saving our results in a temporary array. Um, so let me do this. Let's go back and do our dynamic programming. But let's only print out our entry into this function if we're going to actually do our recursion. So if we're in a base case or if we're just pulling our answer out of our, our memory array, we're not going to print anything. Okay, I'm only going to print out this, this tag showing me the number of eggs and floors before we begin our, our recursive process. So let's see how many times we're actually doing our recursive call. And it's just under 2,000 as opposed to a million. So the dynamic programming is definitely saving a lot. All right, did anyone look up Ackerman's function? No. Oh, sadness. So there's the recursive definition of it. So it's a function of two variables. If the first one's zero, it just returns the second plus one. If the second one is zero, it returns a of m minus one comma one. And if neither is zero, then it returns this other um, value of Ackermann's function, where the second argument also comes from Ackermann's function. Um, and so one of the big things about this is that it grows really quickly. So their example here, if you look at Ackerman 4, 2, the value has almost 20,000 digits to it. And it's a huge number. And it's not obvious from this definition that this should be getting huge at all if M and N are just, you know, single digit numbers. Um, but if you start going through and building a recursion tree for how this is going to calculate, um, and you find out why it's getting so huge. And the only thing it ever does is increment n, right? Everything else is just a value of, of Ackermann's function. So if you were to code this, and it's very straightforward to code. I mean, it's three lines of code, right? Um, 
if you code this, the only thing that actually returns a value is when you increment n by 1, which means this thing must be recursing some huge number of times to get to a number that has 20,000 digits. Right? That's not 20,000. That's like a number with 20,000 digits in it. Um, and so when you, when you start studying this, you're forced to come up with new ways to represent numbers. So this hyper-operation sequence and things like that. Um, because we can't write out numbers of 20,000 digits, right? It's not practical, but we can, we can represent these large numbers using things like this up arrow notation. Um, and it's kind of like exponentiation, but plus plus, right? Because eventually exponentiation only gets you so far. We can write 10 to the 20,000th to represent a number, but what about something with that many digits? with 10 to the 20,000th digits. So that would be 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 20,000. And if you want something with that many digits, it's 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 20,000. And so you can come up with a shorthand for how many times you're going to do that. How many times you're going to raise 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the something. Right? And that's the kind of thing this up arrow notation will get you for. Right? So it starts off not too bad. 1 comma 2 just gets you back to a value of 4, but Ackerman's 4, 3 expands like this and becomes 2 to the 2 to the 65,000 minus 3. So it's, it's an interesting area, um, particularly because of these, these ridiculously large numbers, but also just for the fact that we get there with like very small arguments to this seemingly harmless looking function. Good stuff like that. All right, so if we get a snow day tomorrow, you can play with that. All right, so ready to talk Oracle of Bacon? So, how many people know about the Oracle of Bacon? Woo. <coughs> we do this in 215 usually, but not always. So, um, so the Oracle of Bacon is, is an attempt to take any actor or actress and find how closely they are linked to Kevin Bacon through movies that they've been in with other people. So if you've been in a movie with Kevin Bacon, you have a Bacon number of one. Okay. Um, Kevin Bacon has a Bacon number of zero by definition. So somebody give me a favorite actor or actress. Will Smith. Will Smith, okay. So we put that in the Oracle. Will Smith was in Men in Black with Josh Brolin, who was in Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon. So Will Smith has a Bacon number of two. And it you feels can slightly comical. Yes, <laughs> just slightly. <laughs> so, anybody else know an actor or actress? Dan Aykroyd. All right. So Bacon number two, who's in North with John Ritter, who was in the Hero at Large with Kevin Bacon. Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford, awesome. I may have spelled wrong. Nope, oh, Indiana Jones with Karen Allen, who was in Animal House with Kevin Bacon. Bacon number of two. And it's fairly difficult to find someone with a bacon number bigger than two. It's very difficult to find one bigger than three. <coughs> There's one person with a bacon number of seven. Who's that? Um, it's worth pulling up again. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jack and oh yeah. William Rufus Schefter. And this is awesome because of the way that they. Up oh, bacon number four. So they were in Surrender of General Torrell. That was a newsreel from the 1800s. <laughs> um, and and oh, actually no, there there's one bigger than that. But anyway, this is like an 1800s newsreel, and there was like one other person in it, and they happened to be in a movie in the early 1900s, and it sort of <laughs> builds from there. Um, so there's a bacon number of four, but there's a Yeah. 
Robin Williams? Probably two. I'm gonna guess. Bacon number two, Old Dogs and Lover Boy. William Shatner, bacon number of two. Donald Trump, bacon number of two. <coughs> so yeah, so um, so this this is you know just for fun, right? Um, but it's it's an interesting experiment in data structures. So it's it's kind of an open source thing, and the links on the side here let you get to the bits and pieces of this and you can download the database they're using oh it's already on right so here's here's the database so they go out to wikipedia every month and they scrape all the english pages and they build a movie database out of it um, and so this is like 164,000 movies and each entry is, you know, one of these lines. So it's got the title of the movie, it's got a list of all the people who were in the movie, the directors, um, the year, and so on and so forth. And so given this file, you can build a data structure that lets you do what the Oracle of Bacon does. And basically you're building a graph. Okay, so if you've done 15, or if you haven't done 215, graph is like a tree except that you can have multiple children and your children can actually loop back up to a parent. Okay, so it's like a generalized tree. Um, doesn't have a particular root. You can have cycles, and you can have multiple children. And so what do you do with this? Well, you build a graph that shows who is connected to who through movies. So you start with your first line, and each person who was in the movie becomes a node in the graph. Okay, like a tree node. Yeah? Is this similar to like that one... Uh it's like a genie app, and like it asks you questions. Uh, we're going to get to that later. I'm going to talk about that later on in here, and then we're gonna actually going to code that up in 223. So it's similar. That's something we're going to call a decision tree. Um, and it's a little bit easier, actually, than this in terms of, of managing the data. But yeah, it's going to be similar. Um, so each, each character becomes a node in a graph. And when two characters are in the same movie, we draw a line between them. It becomes an edge in our graph, right? And then, um, and then we can tell who's connected to who by basically how many edges we have. So um, here may be person A, and here's person B, and here's person E, right? So A and B were in the same movie, so we drew a line through them. And B and E were in the same movie, so we drew a line through them. And that tells us that A and E are connected through, at most, two links, two edges. Right, so if this was our entire graph and we were looking for someone's A number, E's A number would be two, right? One, two, B's A number would be one, one edge, and so on. So let me, let me just make a fictitious graph here, and let's talk about how we solve the question of what is someone's bacon number. Doesn't have to be exact, but I made this the other day and it seemed to work well. So let's suppose we're trying to find how closely anybody is connected to person A. And everybody seems to be connected. For example, K goes to I, goes to G, goes to F, goes to B, goes to C, goes to A. There's a big long connection. But K also goes to J, which goes to B, which goes to A. That's a shorter connection. So the goal here is to find the shortest path from A to some particular node. So let's say we want to find the shortest path from A to K. 
Now, one way would be to find every possible path and just keep looking for ones that are shorter, but that's really, really expensive time-wise because each of these nodes might have you know, seven or eight links coming off of it or more, depending on the size of the movie. And every time that you have 10 links coming off a node, you've got to explore 10 different directions. And if each of those have 10 links, you're quickly going to find this like huge, combinatorially explosive number of possible paths. And we're not interested in all paths, we're interested in the shortest path. And it turns out there's a really straightforward way to find the shortest path from A to K. And here's the idea. Start from A and proceed one step. Go to any node that's directly connected to A. Okay, and we get to a few nodes. From each of those nodes, go exactly one step to any node you haven't already seen. So let's go over here, let's do that, let's do that, let's do that, let's do that, and let's do that. Okay, at this point, any node that we just got to, we know has a shortest path of two from A. These first nodes we got to, B, C, D, we know those have a shortest path of one from A. And since we took a single step from those, any node that we then reach has a shortest path of two. The distance to one of these nodes plus one. And now if we take a third step, any node that we get to by taking a third step from any of these nodes we just visited has a distance of three from A. So this is a breadth first search. If you think of it as a tree instead of a graph, we're exploring everything that's close to the root before we move further from the root. That's basically what breadth first means. We go down one level from the root, we explore everything at that level, and when we're done, then we go down to the things that are further from the root. And it's the complement to a depth first search. With a depth first traversal or search, we start at the root and we move as far away as possible, left, 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 until we're down at a leaf. And we say, okay, here's our first node. And then we pop up just one level to its parent, and then we go back down to the right. So we're exploring the stuff that's really far from the root. It's depth first. Breadth first, we stay close to the root. And that's what we're doing basically here. So we're thinking of this as the root, even though it's not a tree, right? But we look at all the children that are directly connected to this. We visit those, and then we move to all of their children and so on. So we can implement this just like we did BFS and PA4. We can use a Q. And we need some extra details. <coughs> so let me draw a Q. And as usual, I'll put the head on the left side. And we're going to start by inserting the node that we're trying to link to, which is A. And I'm not just going to insert the letter of the node. I also want to know the distance that I need to reach A. And since we're starting from A, it's a distance of 0. And the path to get to A is just A. So that's seeding the process. That's how we start the whole thing before we go into our loop. We insert that first node. We also need to do one other thing different from when we do this on a tree. Remember, with a graph, we've got the possibility of loops. We might go from A over to B over to C, and we might go back to A, and we might end up just sort of chasing our tail forever. So whenever we, we visit a node, we're going to mark it somehow. I'm just going to circle it. But in our code, we're going to set a bit called visit it or something. And we're not going to visit a tree a node that already has that visited bit set. OK, so that'll avoid cycles. So we're going to do the same algorithm we did for BFS and PA4. So what were the two steps of our breadth first algorithm? Do you remember? After we've got the initial node pushed into the queue. Remove the head of the queue. Yeah, do whatever we want to do with it. And then what? put his children into the queue. That's the whole algorithm. We're going to do exactly the same thing here. Okay, so we're going to 
remove A, so I'm going to write that down, this is my temp, is A with a distance of 0 and a path of A, and we're going to put all of its children in. Now we need some kind of structure so we can find the children of A, but we'll, we'll look at a structure in a minute. Um, so what are some of the children of A? It doesn't matter what order we do this in, so I'll just go from top to bottom. So we've got B, well I'm going to circle it, so we know that we've, we've visited this node. I'm going to put in B, and the distance I'm going to put in is the distance of the thing I removed plus 1. So I removed a 0, I'm going to put in a distance of 1, and the path is going to be the path I removed with B added to the end. Just take the distance and increment, take the path, concatenate your node's name on the end of it. Any other children of A? C. C. So let's mark C. Let's put C in the queue. Distance is 0 plus 1 is 1. Path is A followed by C. Got one more child of A. That's D. We'll put D in the queue. Distance is 1. Path is A, D. Any other children of A? All right, so remove the head of the Q. So our temp is now B, 1, colon, A, B. And let's push its children into the Q. So what are its children? E. e. So we'll mark E. Distance is going to be 1 plus 1 is 2. Path is going to be the path to B, A, B, plus an E. Next child. F. F. So we put in F, distance 2, path A, B, F. Any other children? J. Yay. Don't forget J. So mark that as visited. Push in J, distance 2, path A, B, J. Any other children? C is already visited, so we don't have to. Right, so no other children, so remove the head of the queue. So at this point, <laughs> right, any node that we visited, we know the shortest distance to that node, and we know the path to it. Okay, so remove the head of the queue. This is C, 1 colon AC. Push its children, well, A has already been visited, B has already been visited, H is new. So let's mark that, let's push in H, distance is 1 plus 1 is 2, path is AC, followed by H. Keep going, pull off the head of the Q, 1 colon AD, any children of D that we haven't marked yet? Nope. So pull off the next node in the Q, that's E. 2, A, B, E. Any children there to mark? Yeah, it's got G, so let's take G, mark it as visited, put it into the back of the queue. Distance 2 plus 1 is 3. Path is A, B, E, G. And we just keep going. So pull off F, and it has no children. Pull off J, and it has no children. Oh, it does have a child. We've not visited. So J is 2, A, B, J, and it's got a child K, which is actually the node we're trying to get to. So if we were going to keep going, we'd put that into our Q with a distance of 3, A, B, J, K. But if we're looking for K, we can stop right there. And there's your shortest path, so we can get to K in a length of three hops, going from A to B to J, and then to K. So it's really, really straightforward, <laughs> right? Now the details can involve a lot of coding, which is okay. But it's, it's the same thing we did with trees. The only complication is we need to mark nodes so that we don't have loops. So throw in a bit saying that we visited this node. Um, we want to keep track of the distance and the path to each node, because we're not just printing these out, we're actually looking for something. And our nodes can have more than two children. In fact, there's no limit on how many children they can have. 
So we need to tweak our data structure a little. But you already know plenty to be able to do that. So let's define a graph node. What do we need to know in order to store one of these nodes in our graph? What kinds of pieces of information are associated with this? Uh, the root node, the children node, and the flag, or... Okay, so we need to know what this node is called, so let's have a name. Or some kind of ID. We need to know its children. Well, with a tree, we have a left pointer and a right pointer. With a list, we have a next pointer. Lists only have one children. If we don't know how many children we have, how should we represent the collection of children? An array of pointers. We could use an array of pointers, but how big would the array be? As big as those children. So we could make a, a dynamically sized array. Say again? Or we could make a vector. Or we could make a vector. Have we talked about vectors? I've never heard about vectors. So a vector is kind of like a linked list. And a linked list might be what we want here because as we're reading that file, the number of children might be growing, right? The number of edges that we're going to draw. So an array might have to get larger and that's a little tricky to do. Linked lists though are really nice if we want them to be able to grow indefinitely. So we might actually want a list. So I'll have a field called children, which is a pointer to a linked list. And let's say it's pointing to a sentinel node maybe. And then we need some kind of flag to say that we've been visited. So I can just use an int and we'll set it to one once we've visited this node. And maybe we want an integer distance. And we need a path. One of these things that says the way we got to J was go from A to B to J. And we could do that with a simple car if we wanted. And so that might be how we define one of these nodes in our graph. This is a struct list. So what's a struct list look like? Well, it's a linked list, so it has some data piece. And it has some next piece. And the next piece is a struct list pointer. <coughs> so what should the data in this linked list be? What kind of thing? Pointer to struct, struct. G, -node. g node, perfect. So our data is a pointer to a struct g node. And each child that this node has, we have an element in the linked list that points to it. And then we need some kind of handle to at least one node in our graph. That might be the Kevin Bacon node, right, node A. And if we have a pointer to that, we can find its children by traversing this linked list. And each of those has a pointer to another graph node. And so a typical graph node might say, the name is A, and the list is something, and it's been visited, and it has a distance of zero, and it has a path of A. And the thing it points to is a linked list of children. And this points to the B node. 
and this points to the C node, and this points to the D node. And each of these has a pointer to a linked list that shows all the things connected to that, right? Including some pointing back to A. And so you've got cycles and loops and things pointing to themselves and all sorts of good stuff like that. And it's this big spaghetti ball mess inside <coughs> memory, but that doesn't bother you, right? So this is where you often begin when you're writing a program or a system to do something, right? So you want to implement this breadth-first traversal algorithm to find links between people in movies. Usually the first step or one of the first steps is defining your data structures, right? That's the foundation from which you build up the rest of, of what you're doing. And once you've got these things pinned down, and it might not look like this, it could be, you know, 20 different ways to do this. But once you've got these things refined, now to go about implementing something like this breadth first search code is very straightforward, very comfortable. Once, once you're comfortable with queues and trees and lists and things like that, right? This is just another type of a list. You make a queue that stores G nodes instead of ints or instead of tree nodes. And if you've implemented queues 10 times already, changing your code to implement a struct G node take you a few minutes, right? So everything that we've been doing in this course and everything we'll do in 223 is sort of your, your collection of building blocks, right? Your Legos that you can put together to do other things. And, and the goal here is to really understand those building blocks, right? To understand how they work, to see some examples of how we put them together to do things like, you know, implement a binary tree or, or determine the balance of a tree or so on and so forth. But through practice with those, right, now when you have something different that you want to do that you've never done before, it's, it's you know, relatively straightforward. And it's no different from, you know, if I were to give you a CSE 121 problem, you could sit down and you could do it probably a lot easier now than you could in 121 because you know about the if statement, you know about the for statement, you know about functions, you're good with those things. They're just tools, right? And that's all that this stuff is. Linked lists, trees, queues, stacks, hashes, they're just more tools. But you usually start with how do you want to structure your data, right? And that kind of defines all the rest of it. And how do you answer that question? How do I want to structure it? it? Depends what I want to do with it. So you have some kind of general algorithm in mind. Well, I'm going to need to find children that are related to this. I'm going to need to know if I've already been to a node so I don't repeat myself and go in a cycle. I'm going to need to keep track of how I got to a node, right? And that informs how you design the data structures. And, you know, you start writing the code, and it's like, oh, I have no way of knowing how I got here, right? So you got to go back, and you got to add a path. It's not a big deal, right? So if, if you're experienced in writing your code and maintaining it and having different versions and debugging and documenting and that kind of stuff, then these are not crises, right? I need to track somehow if I've already been here. Okay, well, I'll add a visited flag, and in my loop where I'm going through my children, I'll check that flag. And it's a few extra statements, right? So that's that's kind of the space you're moving into. And for me and for most people that I've talked to who go through this, right, this is where it gets really fun. Because <laughs> usually, you know, the assignments you're doing in here, you're doing them primarily because they're assigned and they're part of your grade. And maybe there's some parts of them that are interesting. But, but when you've got something you want to do, right, I want to figure out the best way to get from class to class, taking into account traffic, time of day, um, and so on. And then I want to put that into a phone app so students can put in their schedule and it'll just tell them where to go when class comes out, right? Um, you know, you can just do that. All right, so that's, um, that's another instance of breadth first search. Um, Thanks to Kevin Bacon.
All right, questions, comments, reflections on any of that? And, and don't worry if, if this or this doesn't make sense, right? This is just an example, right? Um, but, but if you got an assignment in 223 to implement something like this, right, I think you would be able to do it. Um, and if not, we'll get there. All right, let's um let's look at where we're going next. So I want to talk a little about compression. So compressing data. So when we want to store data in a computer, we usually have some kind of mapping. If I want to store the letter A, I use this pattern of bits. If I want to store the letter Z, I use that pattern of bits. And when you make a file like haha -ha, and I store A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <clears throat> right, it's got hex 41, 42, 43, 44. Those are the ASCII codes for A, B, C, D, E, F, 47 is G, and 0A is the ASCII <coughs> code for a new line. So it's using 8 bits for each character, and if you look at your file, it's exactly 8 bits in length. That's what the first 8 is there. Um, and that's usually how things are stored. But sometimes we want to store a million characters and we don't want to take a million bytes of memory to do that. So let's make a bigger file. Okay, so here's a file, it's 199,000 bytes, and it's just a bunch of lines, 25,000 repetitions of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All right, so we know about gzip. So if I gzip this file, how big is it going to be? Three hundred and forty bytes, much smaller. So we went from two hundred thousand bytes down to three hundred and forty bytes. So how do we take two hundred thousand characters worth of information and pack it into only three hundred and forty characters? So we're looking for patterns, right? I mean, I could tell you what's in this file in one sentence. It's 24,990 copies of ABCDEFG new line. That didn't take 200,000 characters to describe. Well, that's basically what gzip is doing. It's seeing that this pattern recurs frequently, and instead of storing that pattern 25,000 times, it stores it once and tells you some information about how many times it occurs. And that's a version of something we sometimes call run length encoding. If you're run length encoding, basically you have a stream of information. If you have something that occurs multiple times, instead of storing it multiple times, you store it once, but you also store a repeat factor. So if I have 100 asterisks, I might store one asterisk and a flag, and that flag would say this is repeated 100 times. And if it's repeated 100 times, it takes a lot less space to do that than to actually put it in 100 times. But here's a file, haha, -ha. it's got seven letter A's, and it's eight bytes, and if I zip that up, it grew to 29 bytes. So my compression algorithm actually made my file bigger. Why? Because it was only taking eight bytes to begin with. And if I'm going to compress, I'm going to say there's a letter A and it's stored seven times. Well, that sentence I just spoke is longer than A, 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 A. 
right? So there's some overhead associated with this. Okay, so what I want to look at tomorrow is something called Huffman coding. And Huffman coding is a way to compress files that takes advantage of the fact that don't, things don't occur at the same frequency. If you have English text, some letters occur more often than others. Like the, or like the letter E. So we're going to take advantage of that and come up with a way to reduce space.